Captain Deputy Ray Wood, Riverside County Sheriff's Captain Greg Fellows from the Paris Station, DA's um, Chief Investigator Joe Del Giudice. To my left, Chief Deputy District Attorney Vicki Hightower. She's in charge of our DA's Major Crimes Division. To her left, Managing Deputy District Attorney John Henry is the supervisor of the Special Victims Unit. And to his left, Director of our Victim Services, Melissa Donaldson. Thank you all for coming today. I'm, I'm here to announce uh, that this morning, the Riverside County District Attorney's Office filed criminal charges against David and Louise Turpin. You know that as the Paris child abuse case. What I would like to do today is first tell you what we've charged and the potential consequences of those charges, uh, and then tell you a little bit about the why we charged the case and give you a snapshot of some of the evidence. Um, of course, I do want to tell you up front, and I'll probably mention it again, this is an ongoing investigation. We are at the beginning, not the end. Uh, we do have enough information to go forward and file charges, and that's what we'll be discussing today. <clears throat> the charges that we have filed are the following. We have filed 12 counts of, of violation of Penal Code Section 206 against both David and Louise Turpin. That is torture. We filed one count of a violation of Penal Code Section 288B1 against David Turpin, which is lewd act on a child by force or fear or duress. We filed seven counts of violation of Penal Code Section 368B1, which is abuse of a dependent adult. We filed six counts of 273AA, which is child abuse or, or neglect. We have filed 12 counts of false imprisonment. The, the, the date range of these charges, they range from uh, 2010 to the present. And the physical location, of course, is in Riverside County, uh, alleged to have occurred uh, in Murrieta and also Paris. If convicted of these charges, if convicted of all of these charges as currently filed, uh, these defendants are facing up to 94 years to life in prison. The case has been moved to Department 54, the Riverside County Courthouse, and we will be asking for bail to, uh, to be set as schedule. What that means is the normal bail given what we have filed, and that will be our request that bail be set at $13 million per defendant. Now what I'll do is tell you a little bit about the why and give you some snapshot of the facts of this case. Uh, it, is, it is just that. It is just a snapshot. And I will afterwards, I will open it up for questions and I'll do the best I can to answer your questions. But as you, as you probably know, I, there, there, are, there is much we still don't know and there are many things I, I can't answer. So, um, so, th so these are the facts. Uh, first, a quick caveat, as I've said, it is an ongoing investigation. It is a detailed investigation. We're gonna go about this the way we always do, meticulously and carefully. As we always say here at the office, it's more important that we get it right than it is to do it fast. We're fully prepared to seek justice in this case and do so in a way that protects these victims from further harm. So the brief overview, uh, I'm providing a brief over overview to you of the facts uh, in the hope that anyone with additional information about these defendants, about these victims, about these crimes, will come forward and, and talk to the district attorney's office. This, these individuals, the first what I wanna tell you is these individuals uh, sleep all day and are up all night. The, the, all 13 of the victims, uh, including and including the defendants, typically go to sleep around four or five in the morning, uh, sleep all day and then be up all through the night. The, Victims report that as a punishment, starting many years ago, they began to be tied up. First with ropes, one victim at one point was tied up and hog tied. 
and then when that victim was able to escape the, the ropes, uh, these defendants eventually began using chains and padlocks to chain up the victims to their beds. These, as I said, these were, were a form of punishment meted out on these children and these adults. These punishments would last for weeks or even months at a time. The evidence is that three victims were chained up at the time the police first knocked on the door at the home in Paris. The defendants were able to get two of the victims unchained before the police actually entered. An 11 and 14 year old were unchained as the police stood at the door, while a 22 year old remained chained to a bed when the police entered the home. Circumstantial evidence in the house suggests that the victims were often not released from their chains to go to the, to the bathroom. The 17 year old victim that escaped had been working on a plan with her siblings to escape this abuse for more than two years. She escaped through a window and took one of her siblings with her. That sibling eventually turned back, became frightened and turned back and went back into the house. The neglect and abuse started when the family lived in, Fort Worth, in the Fort Worth area of Texas with the parents at one point living apart from most of the children and dropping off food from time to time. The defendants lived in Texas for 17 years. In 2010, they moved to Murrieta, California, and in 2014, moved to their current residence in Paris, California, both, of course, in Riverside County. The abuse and severe neglect intensified over time and intensified as they moved to California. All the victims have now been examined by doctors and medical professionals. All the victims were and are severely malnourished. Specifically, severe caloric malnutrition associated with muscle wasting. To give you an example, one of the children at age 12 is the weight of an average seven-year-old. The 29-year-old female victim weighs 82 pounds. Several of the victims have cognitive impairment and neuropathy, which is nerve damage as a result of this extreme and prolonged physical abuse. None of the victims were allowed to shower more than once a year. I want to give you a, a quick example. Um, one of the reasons for the, and this is all alleged conduct, I do want to mention that. One of the reasons for these punishments of being chained up to a bed were that, um, and, and by the way, the punishments included frequent beatings and even strangulation. One of the uh, reasons for the punishments were if the children were found to wash their hands above the wrist area, they were accused of playing in the water and they would be chained up. None of the victims have seen a doctor in more than four years. None of the victims have ever seen a dentist. The children were, when they were not chained up, locked in different Police, rooms we have a live press and fed from California with the very little on a schedule. Uh, rumored ice raids. This is from KCRA on SD. They were not allowed to have Again, toys, a live press conference with California although there were many toys to found in the house that were in their original package and had never SD4. been opened. Supposedly homeschooled, the children lacked even, they lack a basic knowledge of life. Many of the children didn't know what a police officer was. The 17 year old when asked if there was medication or pills in the home didn't know what medication or pills were. About the only thing the children were allowed to do in their rooms or chained up was to write in journals. We now have recovered those journals, hundreds of them, and we are combing through them for evidence. One other thing, the parents would apparently buy food for themselves and not allow the children to eat it. They would buy food, including pies, apple pies, pumpkin pies, leave it on the counter, let the children look at it, but not eat the food. It's a very complex case. It's important that we gather and analyze this evidence based on the information I've shared with you today. It's my hope that members of the public will come forward with any information about this family or these crimes 
that could aid us in this ongoing investigation and case. If anyone out there has additional information, please call Senior Investigator Wade Walsvik at 951-955-5400, and I'll provide his email uh, later. I do want to uh, say a note of, of thanks to the Sheriff's Department. Uh, they've conducted a professional and excellent investigation, and we're working very closely with Sheriff's investigators. I do also want to mention, before I open it up for questions, uh, this case is, is going to be handled in a sensitive way. We're, as I said, we're fully prepared to seek justice, but we have to do it in a way that protects these victims. They have been um, severely hurt and damaged, and we, we, we cannot cause them any further damage. At this time, I want to call up Melissa Donaldson. Melissa Donaldson is the director of our Victim Services Division. Just want to have her say a few words about uh, our response, the district attorney's response from the victim side. Good morning. Victim services provide, provide services to the victims of all crime types. In specific, these victims, there are so many that are minors and adults, we're gonna be having three advocates that will be assisting and providing services to these children and adults. As Mike described, there are multiple issues with all these children and they are gonna take long-term help. Our victim advocates will go to court, they will work with CPS, and we will provide long-term and short-term services to make sure that they are not re-victimized and that we can help them move as far ahead on their health as we can. We also have a crisis response team that we've developed here in the DA's office and those victim advocates are specially trained in mass casualty and victimization and those staff are ready and serving the victims as well. Okay, at this time I'll, I'll take questions. Is there an explanation on why they behave yes. this way? The Lewd Act is in reference to um, just that, a lewd act that, that we're alleging that um, David Turpin touched uh, one of the victims in a lewd way by using force of fear. Are David and Judy the biological parents of the second That's only a simple live, live press conference um, from Baltimore. I'd be Maryland. speculating at this point. We are looking into all of those things, and that's part of the ongoing nature of the investigation. That individual's attorney from Why did they do this? Again, a live press conference from Baltimore, Maryland with a, uh, the attorney of a woman who was left outside in the cold. You know, um, visit. This is from I don't know that I can answer SD3. that completely, but I'll tell you that uh, as a prosecutor, there are, there are cases that stick with you, that haunt you. And, you know, sometimes in this business, we're faced with looking at human depravity, and that's what we're looking at here. Not that I know of. Yes. Um, Hold on. I'm gonna I'm gonna call up people. It appears that no one noticed what was happening. Part of that is what I shared with you at the very beginning is that the family, these individuals, slept all day, uh, and were up in the middle of the night all night. They were up all night, all of them, uh, not just the parents. Yes. Yes, we're looking at that. Not totally clear at this point, but we do know that the, the um, David Turpin did have a job. He was employed. They did have money coming in. They were able to buy things. Uh, they bought a lot of toys that they never opened. Uh, they bought other things. They bought food that they ate and that didn't share with their children. Yes. Yes, so at least one of the older victims attended uh, classes. I don't know uh, about full college experience, but attended classes. Uh, what we know so far is that um, Louise Turpin would, would accompany him, wait outside of the classroom for him. Uh, when he was finished with class, she would take him home. Sure, yes. This is severe emotional, physical abuse. There's no way around that. This is depraved conduct. Yes, sir.
because it's a good question. We are not charging torture on the two-year-old. Uh, the two-year-old, I don't know why, but the, the, the I, apparently the two-year-old was getting enough to eat, uh, so we're not going to charge uh, torture against a two-year-old. The, the basis of our torture charge is is not just one thing, but it's a combination of severe abuse over time. Yes, sir. No, I cannot do that. Sorry. Yes, sir. The, the situation with the kids, when they're able to leave a hospital, will they be put in the foster care system? Will we treat them differently? And can you describe right now primarily their mental condition as opposed to the physical? They're, they're relieved. I will say that. Um, they're in good hands. They're being cared for. They're all in the hospital. Their well-being is being looked at. Their health is being looked at. They're in good hands. I. As far as where they're going to end up, I don't know. Um, we are going to do everything we can to assist them uh, through our victim services division, and, and hopefully um, they'll be cared for throughout this process. Yes, sir. You're right. I mean, there's a there's a variety, there's a range of of um, thought here. So there, that's all I can share is that there was a plan for two years. To, as to the details of what went into the plan, at this point, I don't know all the details, and that that certainly will come out in court. Let me let me go down here. Uh, you've, I'm sorry. Yes. Oh, I don't. We don't know. I don't know exactly how many times they had to do it. That'll come out later. Yes. I can't comment about that. Yes, sir. I think they will be very significant. I think those journals are uh, going to be strong evidence of what occurred in that home. Uh, has there been a range of uh, reactions to those cases? What would you see when you wanted to go back to one of those young kids perhaps be more open to this notion of change? Not really, no. The, the kids are relieved, yes. Mike. I'm sorry. I, I don't know. I'd be speculating. I, I don't know. I'd be speculating to answer that question like that. Let me go over here. Yes. Mike, you mentioned that there was another sibling that escaped initially to the Philippines. Yes. And that person was able to come to the office and say, I can't go back. She was frightened. That's all I can say. Is that there, there were two of them that left the house. One of them turned back because she was frightened. And what was the age of the other sibling? Uh, I'm, I'm not going to comment on that. Anything else? Yes. Yeah. Well, the, the charge is lewd act uh, under a child fourteen under a child fourteen years of age. So it would be under fourteen years of age. No, I'm not going to identify. Did you get any reaction with the kids at all? No, other than I'm just going to tell you they're relieved. Yes. The mental condition. Right now, we are charging one count of lewd act. This is an ongoing investigation. I will tell you this: that if if our investigation uncovers more crime. We will charge more offenses. Sir, uh, the lewd act was reference to a female, or it's to a female. Is the mental, the mental capacity of the parents going to play a role in this? I mean, are they sort of father and nut? I, I can't answer that question. Yeah. Can't answer so that question. Yes. You wanted to protect the uh, victim in this case. How are you going to try to get evidence without having the victim testify that the parent had sex with the child? Well, the the. I'm not going to comment on that. I, that. It's not when I said I wanted to protect these victims. That doesn't mean they won't testify in court. It means that we want to protect them from being exploited. We want to protect them from um, being further traumatized by what they're what they're going through now. Sir, did Mike, you yes. Share
not that I know of, I'm not, not to minimize it at all, the, the abuse was horrific and over time, but it, this is prolonged abuse that did involve beatings and strangulation, so certainly it, it, there was violence in the home, but we're, we're looking at kids being chained up to their beds. Yes, sir. Yes, as far as we know, they lived apart for a time. We are, that's one of the reasons why we've, we're giving these, this information, this snapshot. We're asking for the public's help, not only here in California, but in Texas. Someone must have seen something. Someone must have noticed something. We need your help. No, I can't. I'm sorry. Yes. Yes, it does. And uh, for example, the kid that was here at the state uh, physical therapy station, was that counted in the case or is there a difference? Uh, I, what, the way I can answer that is to say the victimization uh, appeared to intensify over time. So it, it was what started out as neglect became severe, pervasive, prolonged child abuse. We believe they were born in hospitals. Second, uh, on a personal level, when dealing with a hand that's this lifeless, how do you cognitively truly like, work through it without, I guess, making emotions and feeling like you're dead? Well, I mean, we're not, we're not robots. And you know, this is difficult for everybody that, that sees these images and hears these stories. So it, it, it breaks our heart. But we're professionals. And, and our goal here is to seek justice, protect the rights of the accused. That's another thing that we have to uh, concern ourselves with and protect these victims. But ultimately, our job is to go into court and seek justice, and we're going to do that. Yes? What about the parents? Do you know if they've ever called the police and reported that child abuse? At this point, yes. And as far as y'all can know, that was the case with other victims? No, I cannot. So I'm going to take only a few more questions because we is could do this all day. Is there that the 17-year-old yes. tried to escape prior or anybody else tried to escape prior? Not that, not that I know of. No. Mike, are you able to make a, a go, go ahead. No, not at this time. So Mike, uh, uh, is this a case where the parents, they might say, well, this is our lifestyle, how we chose to raise our children. Is this even a close call at all? The fact that you're uh, up all night, sleep during the day, do you think that would continue to uh, hide the abuse that occurred before his death? You know, crimes like these happen behind closed doors, uh, in dark rooms. And so, of course, uh, uh, people who commit these types of, of crimes have to have to hide their crimes, and I think that was part of it. Who haven't I called on yet? Yes. At the moment, there's so much emotion in your letter. Do you think there's any possibility that you could be killed? It's a good question. I can't answer it at this time. Sorry. Well, just All right, guys. I, I'm going to take. I'm going to take one more last question. Did it get worse? You said it got worse over time. Went from the Bureau of House to the Parent Panel to this day. Yes. A month, six years. Do you, do you think I believe so. Who Who haven't I called on? Yes, I haven't called him. Probably there was. I we at this time I we don't know exactly what that is. But there wasn't something they said to put something in your file. Not to my knowledge. What okay. Time what time is the arraignment today? Okay. The arraignment. Let me let me leave you with that. The arraignment today is at one thirty in Department Fifty Four. I thank you all for coming. Thank you very much.